When the Civil War began, the opportunity to document the horrifying events as they unfolded and to present them to a country hungry for news from the battlefield was offered to thousands of photographers. Yet few seized the moment. This is the story of two men in particular, Matthew Brady and Alexander Gardner, whose vision and determination captured the triumph, the tragedy, and the drama of this country's most trying hour. The Photographer's War, the North, next on the Unknown Civil War. At 7 p.m. on August 24th, 1839, the steamer Great Western left Bristol, England. It was racing for New York City with newspapers from Europe, announcing the details of a wondrous new invention. A Frenchman named Louis Daguerre had discovered how to make photographic images appear on silver-coated copper plates. These images were known as daguerreotypes. The first American to actually see this process in action was Samuel F. B. Morse. While Morse was in Paris the previous spring to secure patents for his invention, the electromagnetic telegraph, he had secretly met Daguerre. The French government purchased the rights to the daguerreotype process and released the invention free to the world on August 19, 1839. Within a month, Morse had a camera made and quickly began demonstrating Daguerre's process to friends and colleagues. One of his early students was an enigmatic young man from upstate New York, Matthew B. Brady. Although most of his early life is shrouded in mystery, it is known that Brady soon mastered the new daguerreotype process and opened his own studio in New York City in 1844. Brady was an excellent artist and energetic entrepreneur. He soon established a name for himself by capturing permanent images of presidents, statesmen, actors, and other luminaries. Portraiture was his main forte. Brady aggressively sought out famous people, and um, it was prestigious in turn to say you were photographed by the man who photographed President so-and-so. By 1850, Brady had photographed enough important figures that he began to advertise their images in his catalog, Gallery of Illustrious Americans. The first international exhibition of photography was held in London in 1851. It awarded the young Brady a medal for the best daguerreotypes. He was now as famous as the celebrities he was photographing. His ornate gallery on Broadway was by then a necessary stop for all prominent Americans. Having your photo taken by Brady, having your Brady done, his name actually became virtually a synonym for a photograph, uh, was something of a sign that you had arrived because of the quality of the work that he did, because of the other people you were likely to meet at his studio. Brady was a great showman. But just as Brady's fame as a Daguerrean artist was reaching its peak, a new process was being developed that forced him to begin abandoning the techniques he had perfected. Brady had made his name in a process that was becoming obsolete. By 1856, the wave of the future was wet plate photography, wherein you had a glass plate negative and you made a paper print, an albumin print, that you could mass produce and that you could also make enlargements from the negative. And it was just beginning to catch on among the more prestigious galleries in the United States, and Brady was not familiar with this aspect of photography. Brady's gallery needed talented photographers who had mastered the new wet plate process. In the spring of 1856, Brady found his man, a recent Scottish immigrant named Alexander Gardner. <laughs> 
Alexander Gardner was born in Scotland in 1821, and he appears to have been a man for all seasons. He later became a, a journalist and a proprietor of a newspaper in Glasgow. Gardner was a superior photographer. He was very sensitive to the different techniques of soft focus, of having a very shallow uh, depth of field. Gardner brought considerable management skills to Brady's gallery. Brady was an inept businessman who was disliked by his employees. He was not particularly a good boss to work for. He uh, did not pay very well. He virtually never gave recognition to individual cameramen. If you delve into the business dealings of Matthew Brady, one of the most amazing things is how many lawsuits were filed against that man. And frequently the lawsuits were over non-payment of salaries. He was a mess. By February 1858, Gardner had been made the manager of a new Brady Gallery that had just opened in Washington, D.C. Assisting Gardner was his younger brother, James, and an 18-year-old apprentice named Timothy O'Sullivan. In the span of just one short year, a new type of photograph had been invented. It was called the carte de visite, or visiting card. It revolutionized photography yet again. A four-lens camera was used to create a negative with four two-and-a-half by four-inch identical images. This allowed for multiple copies of one image to be made very cheaply. Carte de visites were widely popular. People collected them in albums and handed them out like business cards. Gardner immediately embraced this new process, but Brady was reluctant to accept it. Brady preferred to produce large format photographs that he referred to as Brady Imperials. These Imperials were more than 20 inches in length and were often retouched by professional artists to look like oil paintings. Ironically, although Brady did not like carte de visites, he produced perhaps the most famous one of the era. It was taken of Republican presidential candidate Abraham Lincoln, who was in New York City to give an important speech at the Cooper Union Meeting Hall. It's not a photo that's any better of Lincoln than any of his other better portraits, but it's one that was widely mass produced. The technology had come about at that time that you could print thousands upon thousands of images on paper from the glass negatives. And so the Lincoln photograph got all through the North. It identified Lincoln to people for the first time. But now here they were actually seeing the face of a man that they were going to be asked to vote for. Lincoln later credited this Cooper Union photograph with getting him elected. In March 1861, Gardner convinced Brady to make a deal with the E. and H. T. Anthony Company to copy and distribute thousands of carte de visites of leading personalities from negatives supplied by the Brady Gallery. M. B. Brady and Company would receive a small fee for each image, as well as a credit on the back of the print. Credit was given only to the gallery and not to the individual photographers. The fact of giving no credit to his subordinate photographers was not something unique to Brady. He certainly is the best known example of it, and the firm of E&H.T. Anthony in New York, which was the great supplier of photographic materials, the great printer of mass-produced quantities of photographs, the Anthony brothers produced hundreds of thousands of photographs with just their imprint on them when they didn't take any of them themselves. They simply acquired negatives or rights to negatives taken by other photographers. Brady's deal with the Anthonys proved quite profitable, but as the war approached, both Brady and Gardner began to think of other ways to make a profit besides shooting portraits. They began to contemplate going out into the field and documenting the impending civil war. It was not long, however, before other photographers who had worked throughout the North joined Gardner and Brady. Fire! 
The Civil War began on April 12, 1861. Everybody wanted to photograph the action before the war was over. The overwhelming number of photographs taken during this period were camp scenes and portraits of individual soldiers. For northern photographers, their most difficult challenges were yet to come. In late spring of 1861, Matthew Brady's studio in Washington was packed with soldiers clamoring to have their photos taken before heading off to serve the cause. Fire! The war between the states had begun in April, and the Union Army was on the move. Brady had been granted permission to follow it, providing he paid his own way. On July 16, 1861, Brady, one assistant, and two friends set out with two darkroom wagons to Manassas, Virginia, to photograph the first major engagement of the Civil War, the Battle of First Bull Run. Brady had no, no familiarity with what it was actually going to be like to photograph a battle. The battle turned into a horrible disaster for the North, and uh, the Northern Army was routed, and you had this confusing retreat. Before Matthew Brady ever had any opportunity to take any photographs. But Brady managed to find a way to document his efforts. It's typical of Brady that not only did he take his camera to First Manassas, but that he also put himself in the shot. Brady's the showman promoting not just his art, but promoting himself as well as a way of promoting his art. And so Brady has himself photographed in this long white linen duster with a white straw hat under the caption, just returned from the battlefield at first bull run. This photograph illustrates one vital point. Brady may have been an important organizer and financer of photographers, but one thing he wasn't was a cameraman. Now, Matthew Brady suffered from an extreme nearsightedness. And although we have been given the impression over the years that Matthew Brady was actually manning the camera, this is not necessarily the case. In fact, I would say there is no concrete evidence that during the entire Civil War, he actually manned the camera. Gardner, on the other hand, regularly operated the camera and not just for Brady. The U.S. military quickly took advantage of his abilities. Likely through his contacts as the manager of Brady's prestigious Washington Gallery, Gardner became friends with a number of influential military leaders, particularly with the head of the Secret Service, fellow Scotsman, Alan Pinkerton. From the bits and pieces that we have, we know that he did work for the U.S. topographical engineers, and he also did work for the Secret Service. This work was related primarily to making copies, photocopies of maps to be distributed. While Gardner was working with the Army, Brady was sending photographers out into the field to capture dramatic images. Brady began publishing these views in a series titled Brady's Album Gallery. The Brady Album Gallery is one of the most successful series that Matthew Brady's firm ever produced during the war. And it was actually a, a coming together of many elements. You had Brady's prestige and corps of photographers who he dispatched to the field uh, on different expeditions who produced an amazing sequence of series of battlefield and campaign studies that virtually monopolized the field of battlefield photography in the year 1862. But the war's most sensational photographs were yet to come, and they would send shockwaves around the world. In the summer of 1862, General Robert E. Lee's Confederate Army of Northern Virginia was heading north and General George McClellan's Union Army of the Potomac was maneuvering to meet it. On September 17, 1862, 
the two armies clashed near the town of Sharpsburg, Maryland, in what became the bloodiest day of America's Civil War, the Battle of Antietam. Alexander Gardner had ventured out with the Federal Army to document the impending conflict. He brought with him fellow photographer James Gibson. There is some doubt about whether Alexander Gardner was on the battlefield and actually witnessed the fighting on September 17th, but he's clearly present at McClellan's headquarters by the following day, September 18th. And it wasn't until the 19th of September when the Union Army and Alexander Gardner have their first access to the various scenes of fighting. And this is a, an important moment in Alexander Gardner's life because he is on the field on the 19th and begins to take a series of photographs that the uh, likes of which the American public had never seen before. Gardner and Gibson took a total of 95 photographs at Antietam. Their series contains some of the most startling and horrific images taken up to that time. Several photographs were most likely taken near a local church. This particular image shows the Dunker Church, one of the greatest ironies here at the battlefield. Uh, the Dunkers were pacifists. They did not believe in war. This terrible battle fought in their community. In the foreground, an artillery limber and the shattered bodies of dead Confederates. Because so many Confederates fought and died across this ground, the identity of the bodies in the three photographs taken at Dunker Church will never be known for sure. As the photographers made their way around the carnage-strewn battlefield, they stopped along the Hagerstown Pike. Gardner Gibson spent a lot of time here taking five photographs. The reason for that was because of the terrible carnage that was evidenced here. Rufus Dawes was commanding the 6th Wisconsin of the Iron Brigade, which made an attack right down this road. He rode after this battle and said none matched this location for manifest evidence of slaughter. This view shows how the soldiers froze in the positions in which they fell, stiffened by rigor mortis. As the photographers progressed across the battle-scarred landscape, they came upon an even more gruesome scene, a country road that gained the nickname Bloody Lane. In this image, you see two Union soldiers standing just where I am standing now, looking down into the harvest of death of Bloody Lane. This particular area of the battlefield was commanded by General D.H. Hill. He had approximately 5,000 Confederates in this area. Three of his 5,000 sent north to fight into the cornfield. 2,000 remaining to withstand one attack after another by the Union Army. After three hours of struggle, there would be close to 5,000 casualties in this area of the battlefield. The majority of them here literally piled in this lane. Gardner seemed to be obsessed with photographing the dead. 8,000 men were killed or wounded in this general vicinity. And you probably would visit the park and never even notice this rock outcropping, but Gardner and Gibson noticed it mainly because of the bodies that were scattered around it. It's two days after the battle, maybe three. These bodies have been here in the hot sun, and someone has to get them in the ground. In this image taken nearby, Gardner and Gibson managed to capture a Union burial detail in the process of interring their fallen comrades. The Union soldiers were trying to finish the task as soon as possible, Yet, Gardner and Gibson persuaded the burial detail to pause for a photograph. These burial details are performing a, quite an unpleasant task, and they would stand and pose for Alexander Gardner at their own pleasure. And I'm sure Gardner had experiences of asking people to, on burial details to pose for him who just uh, cursed at him and told him to get away. These two photographers were racing against time to capture dramatic views of the dead, particularly Union dead. The first priority for any Union soldier and any burial detail is to get 
your own comrades under the earth. So generally, the Union soldiers would bury their own dead first. Whenever possible, the graves of Union soldiers were marked. Enemy soldiers were buried last, and most often were thrown anonymously into large trenches. This photograph offers a clear illustration of the sequence of burial on the battlefield. It was labeled a contrast, Federal buried, Confederate unburied, where they fell on battlefield of Antietam. It shows a Union soldier in a grave marked with a headboard and an unburied anonymous Confederate beside him. Most of the dead in Gardner's Antietam series would never be identified. However, there is at least one exception. In this unusual case, because of the headstone and being able to read the name and the unit, because of the rosters that were kept here, we actually know this person. And there was an image of him taken before this battle. So you can put a face to the name. Through research conducted by historian William Frazanito, it is now known that the Union soldier in the grave was Lieutenant John Clark, a 21-year-old volunteer from Michigan, cut down in the prime of life. And even sadder is what you see next to Lieutenant Clark's grave. A young Confederate soldier looked as if he's just tossed aside. Probably ends up as an unknown in the Confederate cemetery, his family never to know his fate. Such was the fate of many Confederate soldiers at Antietam. Their corpses lost to history, save for the lucky few photographed by Gardner, these images being the only proof of their passing. After photographing for five days between September 17th and 22nd, Gardner probably went back to Washington. However, it was not long before he was back on the battlefield. In early October, President Lincoln traveled to Antietam to tour the battlefield. He also came to talk with the general who had let the Confederate Army escape to safety, General George B. McClellan. Gardner was there to document the historic meeting. One of my favorite photographs of the war is the famous one taken inside McClellan's tent. And it shows how stiff and how formal and how essentially unfriendly the relations were between the two of them. Each is sitting formally on either side of a camp table. McClellan has no expression in his face, whatever, and Lincoln is an absolute stone image. Lincoln looks distinctly uncomfortable, which he rarely did in a photograph. And I think it's not because of the photographer. I think it's because of the man who is sitting on the other side of the table from him. Lincoln already knows he does not want McClellan in command of his army. It's only a matter of whether or not he can get away politically with firing him. So that image really shows a very, very important moment in the history of the war over and above photography. It shows Lincoln in the act for the first time as an American president of dealing with the commander in chief clause that empowers him to get rid of a very, very popular general who is not serving the cause as he should. Gardner's Antietam series clearly reflected his background as a newspaper editor. Gardner clearly knew what he was doing. You just have a man with a journalistic sense presented with an unparalleled opportunity to record that event. Gardner is the one who might be said to have had an eye for what was the most dramatic, what was the most eloquent, what was the most touching or wrenching about this war experience. So Gardner will record more photographs of the dead at Antietam and elsewhere than any of the other wartime photographers. Brady published the Gardner Antietam images within three weeks of their completion. They caused an immediate sensation when they were first viewed in Brady's gallery in New York City. People were shocked and appalled. Virtually none of them had ever seen images of actual carnage of war. Gardner's photographs of the dead at Antietam garnered more attention than any other series that was produced during the Civil War. Death, it appeared, was big business. Unfortunately for Gardner, all the publicity and acclaim went to Brady. The articles and reviews on Brady's Antietam series invariably 
praised Matthew Brady up and down for his expertise and his energy in uh, producing such a dramatic series. And the irony is that uh, there is absolutely no evidence that Matthew Brady in his lifetime ever set foot on the Antietam battlefield. And throughout 1862, these very important series of photographs that were being produced under the name Brady's Album Gallery were only enhancing Brady's prestige. Gardner and Gibson had the foresight to copyright the images in their own names, but their notice in small type on the front of the picture was greatly overshadowed by the more prominent Brady label on the back. Ten months later, Gardner would have the opportunity to photograph more dramatic death scenes, but this time he would be working for himself. In May 1863, Alexander Gardner left Brady's Washington Gallery and opened his own. He took with him many of Brady's most talented photographers. These are ambitious men who are trying to make their own way in this new artistic technique that's taken the nation and soon the world by storm, and they want to be recognized for their own work on its own merit. Alexander Gardner and the men who produced Brady's album gallery in 1862 had enough foresight to copyright most of those views under their own names. They were virtually able to wipe out Brady's stock of war photographs. And all of those photographs from May 1863 through the rest of the war continued to be issued, but never again under Brady's name and always under Gardner's name and always with the credit line on the back of the image telling exactly who made the individual negative. But it must have been a crushing blow for Matthew Brady, who had been stealing all the headlines throughout 1862, to have much of his stock, at least 80% of his stock, disappear almost instantly. From that moment on, Brady's gallery was in decline. When the break came in May of 1863, Gardner became uh, Matthew Brady's fiercest competition. We do know that this presented an almost unsurmountable problem for Matthew Brady because he had to establish his stock virtually from scratch. Most of the images that he still had were images that were recorded in 1861, and people were no longer interested in those scenes from two years earlier. Gardner had set a new standard for Civil War photography, one that Brady seemed unprepared to meet. One reason why Gardner's images were so popular was that they were seen three-dimensionally by means of stereo photography. Alexander Gardner shot most of his pictures in the field with a stereoscopic camera and reproduced them as stereo views. A stereo camera had two lenses that each took a slightly different picture. They produced a negative with two images that, when printed, could be combined in the mind of the viewer and seen in 3D. Well, this is what's called a Holmes Bates viewer. This was the most common viewer used by people during the Civil War to see stereoscopic views. But this was the most common form of viewer that you'd find in the parlor. And each view was individually placed in the viewer. And then the person viewing would put the hood to their eyes and focus with the focusing bar. It's a very intimate way to view a picture. With the Civil War photographs, you can see details that you just can't see in a two-dimensional photograph. Obviously, the 3D effect is accentuated when you have a very strong foreground element and a nice gap and then a very strong, deep background element. Although stereo pictures had been around since the very beginning of photography, it wasn't until the very eve of the Civil War that they exploded in popularity. Well, it's fascinating to me that the people um, who lived during the Civil War 
by and large saw their Civil War photographs in a more sophisticated and a far more detailed way than we do today. I would say that two-thirds to three-quarters of all of the battlefield photographs in particular were taken on stereo negatives. The stereograph was to the Civil War generation what television is to us today. It was an affordable format. It was a format that was very attractive and sold well. To capitalize on their successes, both Brady and Gardner watched the Union armies closely for the next opportunity to capture more sensational battlefield images. Civil War photographers had a lot of cumbersome and delicate equipment that was quite difficult to transport. In order for either Gardner or Brady to send a team from Washington to capture dramatic battlefield images, the fighting needed to be relatively close by. During the first three days of July 1863, Brady and Gardner got the opportunity they were waiting for. Union and Confederate armies fought the largest battle ever held on American soil near the rural farm community of Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. Gettysburg was situated ideally to be photographed early and extensively after the battle. After all, it's the one battle that undeniably takes place in the heart of northern soil. It's less than 100 miles from Baltimore, less than 100 miles from Washington. Gettysburg was also ideal for another reason, access. It was almost impossible for a northern photographer to photograph a battlefield while it was controlled by a southern army. Fortunately for northern cameramen, the rebels were driven back. Alexander Gardner, along with two colleagues, James Gibson and Timothy O'Sullivan, was the first to arrive on the scene. Gardner begins his work very quickly, and eventually over the period of the next several days, records some 60 negatives. Roughly 75% of the photographs focus on dead soldiers, dead soldiers, dead soldiers, dead horses, death and destruction. It's virtually a duplication of the kind of subject matter that Alexander Gardner had photographed 10 months earlier at Antietam. Gardner would have approached the battlefield from the Emmitsburg Road. The southern portion of the battlefield is the first portion he hit. It was one of the last portions of the battlefield to be cleared of its dead. One of the first images Gardner and O'Sullivan most likely would have taken was of Confederate dead here on an obscure corner of the battlefield. The soldiers pictured were most probably killed on the second day of fighting. Until recently, it was not known where these photographs were taken, uh, and over the years, they had been misidentified uh, on different areas of the battlefield. Historian William Frazanito resolved a good deal of this confusion. Sometimes they were described as dead Union soldiers, sometimes dead Confederates, sometimes first day's battlefield, sometimes second, sometimes third day's battlefield. And through my work, and actually finding the location of these sites by tracking down the various boulders that appeared in a view, I determined that virtually all of these dramatic death studies recorded by Gardner's crew were taken at the very obscure field until I began to piece this all together. Most historians didn't realize there was actually that much fighting in that field. Ironically enough, some of the most famous photographs of dead soldiers on the battlefield come from regiments. Brigadier General Paul Sem's Georgia Brigade, which little is known about in their fighting and role in the battle, since few, few surviving accounts are available. These photographs give us a better idea how heavy the fighting actually was here on the George Rose Farm that second day of battle. Although little is known about the specific encounter that produced the Confederate dead photographed by Gardner's crew on the Rose Farm, even less is known about one of the most famous images of the Civil War. Gardner titled this picture, Harvest of Death. It was captured on a large format camera by Timothy O'Sullivan. To this day, almost nothing is known about the fallen men in it or where it was taken. This and several accompanying views are the only photographs of Union dead at Gettysburg. <laughs>
Another series of photos depicts an equally poignant scene. The Abraham Trussell barn behind me was a scene of one of the most heroic actions during the Battle of Gettysburg. On July 2nd, 1863, the 9th Massachusetts Battery, fighting in its very first battle, was forced to withdraw to this area. Under heavy pressure, they fell back to near the barn when they were ordered to make a final, last, and desperate stand as a stopgap measure to hold back the advancing Confederates. Not only were many of the men in the battery uh, casualties, but most of the horses in the battery were killed. The battery lost nearly 80 of its 100 horses assigned to it. The barn at the Trossel farm still bears a mark from the battle, the same one that appears in the photographs. Ultimately, the story of the photographers at Gettysburg and elsewhere is based on a lot of informed speculation. The photographers themselves left practically no record of their efforts other than the images they took. Gardner had beat Brady to the battlefield and had managed to get a collection of images unmatched except for those he took at Antietam. It remains an unprecedented body of work. The Antietam and Gettysburg series of Alexander Gardner were up until that time unique. And it's difficult for people to understand now because people familiar with Civil War photography through modern books see those photographs so many times with so many different captions that they get the impression that the series Gardner and his assistants produced at uh, Antietam and Gettysburg were the typical battlefield series. They were not. Gettysburg was the last time that Gardner covered a battlefield. Once all the dead had been buried, he and his crew most probably returned to Washington. About a week later, their former boss, Matthew Brady, arrived in Gettysburg. He would photograph the area in an altogether different manner. Matthew Brady reached Gettysburg around July 15, 1863. By the time he and his assistants got to the battlefield, all the dead had been buried. Brady and his crew were forced to focus on other subjects. One of the most famous photographs that the Brady team took while in Gettysburg was of three Confederate prisoners uh, taken from this location, Seminary Ridge, about two weeks after the battle. Most of the Confederate prisoners captured during the battle had been shipped off to prisoner of war camps within days of the battle's end. These men, however, had stayed in the area for various reasons, and Brady must have been ecstatic when he found them two weeks later. This photograph is perhaps the only image that shows Confederate soldiers exactly as they appeared during the Battle of Gettysburg. In all, Brady and his team produced around 30 photographs. A number even featured Brady himself. Matthew Brady's normal policy was to set up the photograph with his assistants, and then he would place either himself or an assistant in the photograph when it was actually taken. And that's the same policy he followed here for the photographs which were taken by his firm at Gettysburg. The views of Brady at Gettysburg were but a continuation of a series which would only intensify as the war progressed. He seemed to have been photographed on every expedition he went on. Several of these images show Brady with dignitaries and high officials as if to illustrate Brady's relationship with the rich and powerful. Brady, it seems, was using the power of photography to create positive publicity for himself. This view was apparently appreciated by another public figure, President Lincoln. Lincoln set for at least 160 some photographs that we know of, and that doesn't take into account those that have been lost over the years, and we know there are many that were taken that were lost. The overwhelming majority of those photos were taken during the war. And Lincoln, I think, rarely ever said no to a photographer who asked him for a sitting. But I think, in part, it's because Lincoln had an instinctive grasp of something that Brady understood, which was public relations, even though the term hadn't been invented yet. Lincoln understood the importance of being seen by his people, and he was. 
Lincoln was photographed by at least 32 different photographers. Gardner took more photos of Lincoln than any other photographer. It is believed he captured at least 31 views of the president. Matthew Brady made 11. Almost all of these images were taken during the war. You can see in Lincoln in photographs the toll that the war takes on him from the time he arrives in Washington in February 1861 until those last images made just a few days before his death. In the span of four years on these photographic images, you can see him go from being a middle-aged man to an old man. You see his face sag. You see the care lines in his face become more furrowed and more deep. You see his eyes tend to wander even more with the exhaustion of the war. On February 5th, 1865, Gardner took the last picture of Lincoln alive. Though marred by a large crack, it is perhaps the most captivating portrait of the president. The famous cracked plate photograph that was at first almost thrown away and later saved for the first time shows a new Lincoln, the one we might have seen in Reconstruction had he lived. Almost with a smile on his face, Lincoln who's relaxed despite the ravages of the war that you can see in the, that furrowed brow and the sagging flesh, you can still see the intense relief. On April 9th, 1865, Confederate General Robert E. Lee surrendered his army at Appomattox Courthouse, Virginia, effectively ending the Civil War. Five days later, on April 14th, President Lincoln was shot by assassin John Wilkes Booth. Lincoln died the next morning. The following day, while the nation mourned Lincoln's loss, Matthew Brady was in Richmond, Virginia, making history at the home of General Robert E. Lee. I'm standing at the back door of the Stuart Lee House in Richmond, Virginia. It was to this house that Lee came after his surrender at Appomattox. And it was on these crisscross bricks in front of this door on April 16, 1865, that Matthew Brady took six famous photographs of Lee in uniform. Two of the photographs show Lee with his son, General Custis Lee, and with an aide, Colonel Walter Taylor. Brady said it was supposed that it would be preposterous to get Lee to pose at such a time so soon after his defeat, but that he personally thought that this would be the most historic time. By the time this photograph was taken, Brady's fortunes were fading fast. His mission to organize a corps of photographers to systematically document the war had been very expensive. He was terribly in debt. Matthew Brady's uh, uh, career did not end on a very happy note. Because of his financial problems, by the 1880s, uh, he had lost his businesses and he was being employed by other people. And by the 1890s, he's virtually a pauper. He always had hope that he would be able to sell the remaining negatives in his collection to the federal government, that that Civil War photography would eventually pay off. And it never did for him, and he died a fairly pathetic person. Alexander Gardner ended the war on a high note. He had not only managed his business profitably, but also succeeded in maintaining important contacts with high-level government officials. Gardner's firm was granted exclusive access to several historic events, the most important being the execution of the conspirators to assassinate President Lincoln. His career thrived after the war. In 1866, Gardner gathered together 100 photographs taken by him and his fellow photographers and published a volume called Gardner's Photographic Sketchbook of the War. It was the first ever book dedicated exclusively to Civil War photography. Gardner remained successful until his death in 1882. Over the next several decades, the Library of Congress and the National Archives managed to acquire collections of photographs taken by Brady and Gardner's firms. Today, these images are the property of the American people. They serve as a testament to the dreams and efforts of two men
who changed our view of war forever.